I can hear you, yeah. Ruin you froze. Ruin you frozen. I not sure if you can hear me. You're on mute, Ryan. Do you sometimes wonder where will Sri Lanka end up at this rate? Are you worried about your future and the fate of our beautiful nation? Are you interested in knowing what you can do to improve the situation of this country as the future of this nation? Good evening, everyone. I am Yitraka Ruvin Mapa, and I warmly welcome you to the social platform, a discussion to address the current issues in Sri Lanka and to answer the questions that you have on what we as the youth could do to make a positive change. Now, the esteemed speaker for today's discussion generally needs no special introduction. However, if I were to pick a few of his key achievements, I will introduce him as the executive group director of the Capital Maharaja Group, a Fulbright scholar, an Eisenhower Global Fellow, and an Asia 20 month young leader. He sits on the global advisory board of the Watson Institute of Public and International Affairs at Brown University in the United States, where he is also visiting faculty. In addition to his role as a group director at Capital Maharaja, he also spearheads government. In addition to regularly addressing global forums on a variety of topics. He has the distinction of addressing the UN on several locations, and he's an integral part of Sri Lanka's fight against modern day slavery with his role in the Bali process. I'm talking about someone who has inspired generations of youth leaders, the living legend, Mr. Shivan Daniel. Sir, it is a humble privilege to have you with us today. Hello oh, and uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, the honor is entirely mine. It's great to be here and speak to all of you young guys and girls. Now, Mr. Daniel, to kick things off, as I mentioned before, you are an individual whose name is known throughout this nation. You're a person who we see very frequently on TV and on other platforms as well. But what is most special is your story that has inspired thousands of Sri Lankan youngsters to aim for the stars. So if I may, who is Shivan Daniel? Apart from the countless achievements and the distinguished titles, and more importantly, behind the screens. Well, thank you. Um, hmm. I think uh, it's not a very interesting story, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> just a very ordinary, uh, kid who was born uh, to great parents, um, very brave parents, I have to say, because in the 70s, when they were married, um, they did something quite extraordinary. It was an interracial marriage, because my dad comes from a very traditional um, Jaffna Tamil background. He's from a village called Udovil in Jaffna. And my mom, um, her roots are in the south, in Gaul, 
in a town in a little village called Wakwell. That's her dad, and her mom is uh, a Dutch burger from Colombo. And when you know these two families, which had literally nothing to do with each other, uh, the you know the the two individuals decided to marry. It was uh, quite a rebellious thing. And if you can imagine, in the late seventies and in the eighties, that was um, not a not the most popular thing to do. But they they did it, and they had me and my sister after me, and we lived a very ordinary, happy life. And I think it was extraordinary in a sense that um, because of the multiracial background. I grew up appreciating everything that was Sri Lankan because I celebrated all of the you know cultural events and the religious holidays and everything. And uh, it also made me very curious about these different cultures that made up Sri Lanka because I felt I was you know part of all of the cultures and the cultures were part of me. So my dad worked for a, a company for his his entire career, one company, and. Um, he worked really, really, very hard to give me an education. I started out uh, at a very tiny school called St. Thomas's College Corte. And then um, because of the grade five scholarship, I was able to move into uh, St. Thomas's Mount Lavinia. And um, also my dad's un untiring efforts to you know, get me into St. Thomas's. And you know, he, he really, he was not a man who had a lot of education, but he was a man with a lot of determination and commitment because he lost his father when he was only 14. And it would have been quite, uh, excuse me, it would have been quite easy for him to uh, go on a completely different route, but he decided that education was, for education for his children was very important. So he placed a lot of emphasis on that. And he was a really strict disciplinarian when it came to getting me to focus on my studies. I'm very thankful he did that. My mom was the doting mother. You know, she she uh, would take me to school and make make sure my sister and I were taken care of. And you know, just an ordinary middle middle class um, family in Colombo. We never owned a home, so we kept moving from place to place. And um, you know, that was awesome because we we got to meet so many different people, and our memories are so varied. I have so many different friends from all of the places we lived in. Um, and you know, took the bus to school. <laughs> pretty, pretty normal childhood. Uh, I wasn't a, I wasn't very good in, in well, I was quite uh, average in, you know, my academics as well as sports, but that didn't stop me. I you know I tried really hard. And, um, particularly at St. Thomas's Mount Lavinia, which is you know, quite competitive. Uh, did fairly okay, it didn't trouble the scoreboard in uh, cricket terms. But it also, I think, gave me a great perspective on the importance of education and um, the importance of discipline. I think that's something that as a Thomian was uh, inculcated into me in school. But I think the key turning point was really after I left school and uh, realized that if um, I wanted to do something extraordinary with my life, then I couldn't do ordinary things. Uh, and there were lots of reasons for me not to succeed. You know, because when you're not particularly talented in anything, and when you don't have uh, a springboard to help you, like you know, a, a family background or family wealth or whatever, um, and your name is Shavan Daniel, which is odd to begin with, <laughs> I knew that I had to do something different. And um, I have to say that right from the word go, I had so many people that supported me and helped me along the way, and that's incredibly important even for all of you guys listening in you need to find people who have a vested interest in your success and I was very lucky um, I had parents 
that were obviously interested in my progress. Um, and I met people who spent time with me, advising me and uh, giving me opportunities that I absolutely did not deserve. Uh, I've, you know, I've had a really colorful existence, to be honest with you, um, ever since I was 16, because um, I hadn't traveled overseas until I was 16. And uh, something not many, you know, almost nobody knows was the fact that I went off to the US when I was 16 on a scholarship and um, spent time roaming around the US in like 1995, just right after my O levels. Um, you know, something that not many Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan kids were doing at that time. Um, and I think that sense of independence, the sense of adventure, the sense of um, exploring and trying to figure out new things and meeting new people has never left me. And um, it's something that I definitely would encourage all of you guys to pursue as well. And those, you know, those years where I spent traveling in the US and basically just wasting time, to be honest with you, <laughs> not doing anything particularly constructive. Um, and then having been forced to come down to Sri Lanka and do my levels it really gave me a sense of um, what I enjoyed doing, which was, you know, constantly pushing myself to do new things and enjoy myself and uh, be on, on a life adventure, which has its ups and downs. So that's the, that's the boring story. I, I don't know. <laughs> I warned you, it wasn't very interesting. It, I believe uh, the, <clears throat> what makes your story so special is the fact that I'm listening to your story quite possibly for the fourth or the fifth time. But every single time you listen to your story, there's something new that you could take out from it. And there's something new that you could learn uh, that would help you in your life. And I believe that is what makes your story quite special, Mrs. Daniel, and something that we love to hear. And you mentioned the fact that you grew up or rather you were raised during a time of crisis, a different type of crisis. Now, Sri Lanka is going through another crisis, which we are all quite familiar with. So, Mr. Daniel, what is your take on the current situation of the country? Well, um, I think I'm uh, finding it difficult to be surprised uh, because, you know, I've been involved with uh, the news media now for nearly 25 years. It's 25 years. And um, when you assess the direction Sri Lanka's economy and politics has changed, taken over the past couple of years, maybe past couple of decades, um, I think a factual assessment would basically paint a picture, paint the picture that we're facing today. Um, so I'm not sure anybody who assesses um, our politics and our economic progress or lack of it over the past maybe decade and a half, would be too surprised that we're here. Um, but I don't really, I don't necessarily see it as a doomsday scenario for two reasons. Um, firstly, we're dealing with one of the most incredible nations on earth. And, and this is not just some patriotic statement that's empty or devoid of facts. Um, we really are kind of like the Colombo seven of the world, uh, just because of our geopolitical location. And secondly, because um, other nations around the world have come out of situations like this, and they have got back on their feet and they have prospered. So there are examples, you know, South Korea, Argentina, Argentina is not a great example, but South Korea certainly is, um, where they've faced similar challenges, worse challenges that they've been able to come out of it. So having studied some of um, what these nations have done and also having a very clear appreciation of Sri Lanka's potential. Um, yes, we're in a crisis, but it's not um, the end of the world for us. We need to be thinking about what we should be doing in the short term, medium term and the long term. And remember that it's during a crisis that leadership is born, that opportunity is born. So 
So I think for young people, this is a, you know, while it's easy to look at it as a very bleak uh, time where nothing's going to work and there's absolutely no hope. The other way to look at it is, is that it's a time of uh, opportunity, a time to hone your leadership and a time to really stand up and be counted. And I think going back a generation when you know, I was maybe your age, um, there was a horrible civil war going on. Going to school was uh, it's like running the gauntlet. You know, you, you don't know, you didn't know which bus was going to blow up, and it was it was really really terrifying. But you got on with it. You um, we had a lot fewer options than you guys might have today. But um, at the same time, you have to be able to get a hold of the crisis and somehow figure out how can I find an opportunity in all of these amidst all of these obstacles. So to give you a, a concise answer, um, the, my take on the current situation is that it's obviously very bad. I don't think I need to say that. I don't need to go into details either. It's possibly going to get worse. Um, but if we make decisions based on facts, then we definitely can make the turnaround time far quicker. But if we delay making decisions, and if we delay addressing the cause as opposed to simply treating the symptoms, then this could get really ugly. But regardless of that, I think Sri Lanka does have the leadership it does have the people uh, and it does have young people like yourself with the intent to lift us out, lift us out of this mess and take us to our true potential. So um, that's my take. I'm very hopeful, to be honest. It is during these challenging times that leadership is born. You mentioned that. Now, Mr. Daniel, we see that there are lots of leaders coming into place during this crisis. We see the youth engagement, more specifically, coming onto a level that quite possibly we may have not seen before. We see that today's youth is not reluctant to express their patriotism. They've been taking proactive measures to create a system change that could quite possibly change the course of the entire history of the entire future of this country as well. So, Mr. Daniel, what is your opinion on the patriotism which is expressed by the youth of this country? It's incredible. It's, um, you know, you feel so hopeful and enthusiastic at the outpouring of patriotism. And I, I also um, don't think it's empty patriotism. You know, the, the youth you guys have really shown us um, how committed you are to change. And I think the reason for that is because you just have so much more knowledge and awareness than the generations before you. And you also have platform, a platform to make your voice be heard, which is very important. And you're being so responsible with that platform. Um, you're being so proactive and so engaging and so tolerant that it gives me the indication that um, the future of this nation is in such great hands. If I was an investor, I would be investing in Sri Lanka regardless of the economic chaos right now because I would see how amazing the future of this country is because it's got such awesome young people. You know, I mean, this is something that's not been done anywhere in the world. Young people um impacting change by singing and dancing and creating a township in the middle of a capital city you know in a matter of weeks <clears throat> without a leader and then this township somehow self-sustaining itself and you might have political opinions about it but at the end of the day this has never been done in Sri Lanka and I think it's a it's it's emblematic of how creative we are as a people 
uh, the same creativity and the same leadership that led us to build Sigiriya and the Ruan Valley Sahaya, Abhay Giriya, Jetavana Rame, uh, Rajakala, these amazing monuments in human history. The same ingenuity we see today amongst the young people. And it's proof that as a country, we haven't lost um, what makes us Sri Lanka. It's very, very much here. And there's a, obviously a dichotomy and a mismatch between what the young people are saying and what we see in politics and um, in terms of national policy, et cetera. But I think what's important to understand, particularly for young people is to realize that change is slow, change takes time. Um, change, particularly um, changing governance is, is kind of like turning a ship. President Obama famously said that a government is a ship and not a speedboat. So, you know, you can't turn a ship in a matter of minutes. It'll probably topple over. And with each uh, move or maneuver, with each government, with each um, mini social revolution, I think we're turning the trajectory of this nation towards where it should be. So everything that the young people have done over the past couple of weeks, um, I think is just an amazing contribution towards setting us on the right course. And you guys should be really very proud of yourselves. Indeed, sir. I believe uh, it was in 2017 that you spoke on the subject of how the youth should take on challenges, which you touched upon before as well. It is there that you mentioned that the challenge is similar to a mountain standing in front of you. It is up to you to decide if you will push hard to go over it or give up and decide to call it quits. I think this is quite appropriate. Uh, it is a quite appropriate comparison to the current situation of this country. Now, while some youngsters, as you mentioned, have took up the leadership and decided to stay back and fight, some others have genuinely lost hope because they believe that there is no salvation. So, Mr. Daniel, my question to you is, what is your opinion on Sri Lankans migrating from the country, or more specifically, on the youth of this country leaving Sri Lanka? Well, look, I mean... <clears throat> I completely understand the um, imperatives that will that will um, sometimes force a young person to consider leaving Sri Lanka. It could be the imperative of looking for opportunity, education, um, just to get away from the hardship and the difficulties and the challenges that we're facing right now. And there could also be the argument that, look, this is this is our time. You know, I'm not going to be young ever again. And therefore, I, I want to be spending my time and my efforts um, educating myself, gaining the right kind of experience, uh, surrounding myself with world-class people. And there's really nothing wrong with that. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any argument for me to that that might hold water where I ask people to stay back um, and not make use of an opportunity overseas. It just doesn't make you know, sense. We're, we're kind of in a global village and crossing borders is, is going to be something that all of us do increasingly more often, right? Um, but I think also, as a young person, when you're thinking about opportunity, you know, it's all about opportunity. And the reason that I use this word so often is because it is so often misunderstood. Opportunity is not necessarily... Um, getting an up, you know, uh, getting into Harvard or Oxford. Um, that is access, and that is um, yes, it's an opportunity, of course. But I think more often than not, the greatest opportunities come your way, disguised as difficulties and challenges. Okay, and that's essentially a story of my life as well. So if there's if there's anything that I can share with you, it's it's that one lesson. Um, I'm, not the, I'm not the product of 
a very um, rational decision making process. I am, I am the pro product of somebody that often took up problems and challenges that nobody else wanted to touch, that nobody would you know, touch with a barge pole. But I would um, take up that opportunity with the hope that it would somehow give me an opportunity and the chance to be a leader, to show what I was made of, what I could do. But also, importantly, um, that it would give me experience. The key here is experience, because ultimately, if you're thinking about leadership, okay, um, it's all about quality decisions. That's it, okay, quality decisions. How good are your decisions in the different spheres of leadership, managing people, innovation, teamwork, whatever it might be. And your decisions, the quality of your decisions will improve along with the type of experience that you have. Now, when I say experience, I don't mean spending 10 years doing something or 15 or 20 years doing something. I think experience is different. I think experience is how many challenges have you taken up? How many times have you failed? And how many times have you learned out of your failures? And the best time for you to do that is as a young person, when you have a little less to lose, and uh, when you're, you know, maybe before you have a family and you start doing the other things that human beings do. Um, and that's the time you should be taking on board as much experience as possible. Now, there is a, there is a difficulty here because you'll be surrounded by people who are doing a lot better than you. Okay. Your friends might be driving cool, fancy cars and they might uh, be holding, you know, they might be employed by Google or whoever. Um, so it's a difficult pill to swallow at times. You know, when you are still traveling around in a bus and you're wondering what's going on, what's the point of all of this, right? Um, but look, if, you're, if your intent is right and if your intention is, look, I want to really get some leadership experience under my belt, it's an investment. An investment comes with sacrifice. So while... Um, I'm not, see, so it's an individual decision whether you want to go out of Sri Lanka or what you want to stay here. That's completely up to an individual. But I think whether you are here or, you know, overseas, whichever country you, you decide to travel to, the fundamentals of leadership remain the same. How much are you willing to sacrifice to learn, um, to gain ex as much experience as you can at an early age? And then where can you use that experience? Where will you get that opportunity to be a leader? Is it in Australia or is it in America? Or is it here in Sri Lanka? A nation that's essentially crying and dying for leadership. So you tell me, is the opportunity over here or out of Sri Lanka? So, you know, it's, it's a difficult decision for a young person, but I think myself and many of my peers were in the same exact position because the war didn't look like it was ending anytime soon. So many of us um, had the option of traveling overseas and basing our lives overseas. But there were those of us who decided to make use of um, the opportunity and the gap that we saw existing here in Sri Lanka. So I hope I've given some food for thought. Indeed, Mr. Daniel. I hope that this did actually give some food for thought for the audience as well. And you gave us the mindset that we should have moving forward. So, Mr. Daniel, my next question is regarding this. While taking this mindset forward, while taking this attitude of accepting challenges, of not giving up and calculating, inculcating this value of perseverance, what specific actions could the youth of this country do in order to improve this current situation? What is our role in this? What is our duty in order to improve this country right now? I, I think you, what, what the youth is doing right now is exactly what the youth should be doing. Okay. Um,
I think the fact that many young people have decided to take a stand for the truth and to, to take a stand for the future is amazing. Um, it's not easy, but I think what um, young people have decided to do using social media particularly is phenomenal. Same social media and Facebook accounts, TikTok and Instagram that all you guys used to use to make fun of each other and you know say things and argue and you know whatever they're using for really impactful meaningful change which um the, you know maybe half a generation before you wasn't doing so it's really not up to me to tell you guys to do how to do something because you're already doing it the right way what i can encourage you to do is um try to understand um a little more about this nation that you've been born into, you know, because that is what will really open your eyes and help you understand what a treasure and a privilege it is to be a Sri Lankan. Um, I know the counter argument is everybody in every nation believes that they've you know, been brought born into the greatest nation on earth. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, but not every nation is a civilization. Now I understand civilizations are not going to give us fuel. It's not going to give us gas. It's not going to give us, uh, it's not going to help our dollar crisis. I get that. But there's a deeper and more profound reality that we're living in. And that is the fact that Sri Lanka's potential is so much that we're doing so little with it. I think once we understand the potential, then that automatically gives birth to a lot of hope. Okay. So, for example, there is a reason that our history um, is so rich, that our culture is so rich. Culture isn't something that is manufactured, culture evolves. And the Sri Lankan culture is such that if you really think about it, if you, if you think about what's happened in the past two, two years maybe, um, this is not a political assessment, but it's more of a cultural assessment. If you really think about what's happened, we've had a, a really, really powerful government with a two thirds majority. We've had a president, you know, in terms of constitutional power, probably the, the most powerful president in the world. Within two years, um, has been shaken. The foundations of this power has been shaken by the people. It's not. It wasn't shaken by an opposition or a political party or even a political movement. It was shaken by a people, and that is because of this incredible Sri Lankan culture. I don't believe for a second that the Sri Lankan people make immature voting decisions. I think the people ultimately make the right decisions, even though it might be unpalatable to some, even unbelievable at times. I think it's the right decision because it must be seen as um, in, a, in, in, in relation to a greater arc of the evolution of our democracy. And if you think about throwing a ball from A to B, okay, um, you, can't, you can't take a snapshot of that ball in the air and say anything about where it's headed, right? You've got to see the entire arc of where it's headed, the velocity and the direction. So similarly, we're headed somewhere. And um, I think we're headed to a good place. So the maturity with which our culture has helped us progress, and at times it might feel like um, we've made wrong decisions and we've made broad choices, but I, I don't think so. I think there's this overriding, incredibly strong culture that some are protecting us and will take us to the right place. And even this pain that we're going through right now, this difficult, challenging process, it's kind of like a necessary surgery. Okay, 
just imagine you have to go through surgery. It's not fun, right? You need to be anesthetized and it's going to hurt and it's going to leave a scar. That's for sure. But ultimately, the patient will live and probably become very successful. So this is that time of surgery that we're going through, um, which is again, I think a part of that progress in the evolution of our democracy, in the evolution of our nation. And um, the young people have done their, have played their role and the, the only thing that I would request is that you spend time, invest time in our, trying to understand our culture, our history, uh, in a much deeper sense than just uh, you know what we're taught at school or at university and ask ask yourself the question how come sri lanka being just 65610 square kilometers a, a little island as we are told um, had such a lot going on here something that we're fed from the time that we are essentially born is the fact that we're the pearl of the indian ocean you know, we're, we're told we're so small, you know, and that's the mindset that we were born with, right? And that's something that really gets to me because, you know, yeah, okay. So in terms of land mass, we're small, but we've been punching above our weight for, for centuries, for eons. Um, our civilization is on par with the world's greatest civilization, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Incas, the Aztecs, and how was that possible? How was that possible? It wasn't America or China or India, although we are obviously greatly influenced by all of these cultures. It was um, something else that worked in this nation that helped the people build this civilization and retain that sense of nationhood over thousands of years. You know, if you think about it, America has existed as a nation just for around 400 years, I think, or maybe 300 something. Right, so it's a blip on the radar, considering the you know three thousand plus years of written history, and probably much further than that in terms of unwritten history. So, um, understanding where you come from, who we really are, is is really very important, because it gives you a sense of um, a, a heritage almost that that is then a duty for you to protect. And uh, it can be the fuel that drives you forward, particularly when things get even tougher in times to come. Indeed, uh, Daniel, I believe what you said is very true, which is the fact that you know, Sri Lanka is blessed with resources, of course, but I believe, as you mentioned as well, Sri Lanka's best gift or the biggest resource that Sri Lanka has is its culture, is its rich history that gives us something worth fighting for. It gives us reason to keep pushing to save this little pearl in the Indian Ocean. Not so little, in fact. Even though we are little, we have done so much. And this gives us reason to keep moving forward and keep pushing forward to rescue this motherland of ours. Absolutely. Now, Mr. Daniel, you highlighted, you touched upon the fact of social media in the beginning of your answer. You discussed how social media rallied the youngsters of this country, <clears throat> how we have taken good use of it. Now, my next question is regarding this. We see that with the rise of social media, a lot of misinformation is being spread. Now, my question is, what is the responsibility of the youth of this, of this country who consume this information and who reshares it with their social groups to do so in a responsible manner? What is their, you know, how, how can they do that? Yes, great question. It's really the democratization of the truth. Um, all of this while, it was up to a media organization or a newspaper or a television network <clears throat> to, to tell the viewer, this is the truth, okay? And generally you would believe that that truth is backed by fact. 
and not just an opinion. Uh, at times, of course, that information can be fake and it can help and it can result in bad or wrong decisions. But now all of that information is basically um, available on this to all of us. So this becomes as powerful as any media network, just a, just a mobile phone. And you, Ruin, as just an individual, can have more followers and believers than an entire media network. So when you think about, let's say, for example, News First or any media network, any news organization, I think it's correct to say that the people expect the highest standards of journalism, um, the highest standards of fact checking, and they would expect unbiased, credible news and information. And that's certainly what we at News First try to do. We try to be very, very mature. And, and that at times that makes us very unpopular. Um, but that's okay, because Popularity is not a gauge for us in terms of um, our obligation to the people. Our obligation to the people, what we believe, is to be based on the truth. And we believe that that's what people expect. Now, if you don't base your reporting on the truth, which must be backed by fact, then eventually you will distort the decisions and actions of the people. Because you're, what you're doing really is you're, you're dealing with trust. People will watch you, listen to you, view you, like you, follow you, share you based on trust. And you're using the, um, the influence you have as a purveyor of trust to influence people to do different things, okay? Um, and we see that happen all around the world where media networks can try to influence people in different ways, you know, during elections and, and whatnot. I'm not gonna go into that. But the point I'm trying to get at is that the same high standards that you hold the media network to, you must also hold yourself to because you have the same power because that truth has now been democratized. Okay, so when you have, when you've been given this, this device, you own it and you can influence 25,000 people, then you must also understand the responsibility that comes with that influence, um, with that tweet, with that. Um, Instagram update with that Facebook status update. Um, it must be beyond just an opinion. It must be rooted in um, in fact, and you must take the time to assess the fact. Because if you don't, and if it's only op an opinion, and if it's only there's nothing wrong with opinion, but if it's going to ultimately be counterproductive, well, then we're all going to lose. The, the, the um, attraction to say something on Facebook or social media so that you get lots of likes and shares, um, I'm not going to deny it. It feels great, right? I mean, who doesn't like you know, to see all of those hearts and thumbs up stuff and all that? You know, that's fine. But I think if you're dealing with um, people's trust and important things that matter, not just pictures of your puppy, that's fine, you know, but <laughs> things that matter to the nation, to the people, things that are important to the future of this nation and the future of young people, then I think it's important to be responsible, um, to take the time to study your subject to, and also to be tolerant, just as, as you are tolerant at... Uh, Gota Gogama, you know, you're tolerant to different opinions and different people's views. 
I think tolerance on social media is also important. No, you know, you don't have to agree with everybody and everybody doesn't have to agree with you. But ultimately, a very vibrant discourse will result in an exchange of knowledge and information that will make you and your followers um, a lot more aware of whatever it is you're talking about. So basically, it's important, Rowan, that young people particularly understand, and not just young people, everybody, you know, I'm speaking for myself as well, um, that every time you decide to open up that social media page and say something, you're influencing someone. Somebody who trusts you is listening to you and is going to probably act on something you said. That is responsibility. And that responsibility mustn't be taken lightly. Now, you talked about the responsibility that comes to the youngsters in this country with the democratization of media. Along with that, it reminds me of a certain incident that happened very recently. A couple of days ago, a friend of mine approached me and asked a small question that quite frankly left me stumped as well. She is someone who is extremely interested in sharing posts and her opinion on the current issues of the country. But she's held back by her fear of what the outcome or the consequences of it may be. For example, the type of responses that she would receive, the criticism that she would get. More importantly, even regarding her own safety. So, sir, as a person who has been criticized, as a person who has faced a lot of problems for sharing unbiased and true and raw information, what is the advice that you would give to someone like that? Well, it's difficult for me to um, advise anyone on a very specific question of that nature without exactly knowing the nature of the question, the nature of the news and the nature of the platform. Um, so Rowan, I'm going to be very careful here and not answer that question. I believe that is a wise response indeed. <laughs> now, since we are running short on time, which I believe is something that happens quite fast when you're actually enjoying what you're doing. You're engaged in too much, I think, right? <laughs> no, I believe it is because this conversation has been very light and it has been a conversation where each and every second was st mentally stimulating and we found it interesting. Now, before I wrap up what I have in line for you, I'd like to ask you one last question. Yeah. So now there are hundreds of interactors from around yeah. the country watching us live. Being an interactor yourself during your schooling years, what do you think is the responsibility of the interactors of this country? What do you think can they do in their capacity? Well, I think um, the fact that you're an interactor already tells me that you're interested in um, a united effort towards doing something good and something that's better for your community. If not, you probably wouldn't be an interactor. And you're interested in bettering yourself, you're interested in meeting new people, um, and you're interested in um, a nation and a community that's united and strong. I think believing in that ideal, even as things look so dark and bleak around us is my first um, challenge to all of you, because it is a challenge. Let's, let's be honest. Um, I can use a thousand flowery words here and say, you know, so many things that can be quoted um, and just give you some inspirational rhetoric. But the, but the honest truth is that it's tough for all of us. Um, and I can only imagine how tough it is for you guys, all of you young guys who are just so enthusiastic and so full of energy. And you just want to break out and do something that's, you know, amazing. And the only thing that's holding you back is everything that's so external and out of your control. Well, control what you can. Control yourself. Um, inculcate all of those qualities inside of you that you will need when this country 
begins to change course. Um, use Interact to engage with communities, engage with young people who may not see a future or even the future that you see. I think that's your responsibility for certain because you speak the same language. You know, it's difficult for me or anyone who's not in your age group to speak to um, every young person, but you certainly can. And I think um, Interact provides that amazing opportunity to do that, not just with words, but with action. Remember, everything that you do is being watched and people will be inspired. And not just young people, but I think Interact has a great opportunity to be an example for the adults as well. Well, you guys are adults, but you know, the older adults, the politicians, the CEOs, corporate Sri Lanka. Um, I think many of us who are a generation away from you sometimes wonder, you know, why couldn't we, we have done what you guys are doing? Because we have so much more influence, so much more resources. But you guys, with literally nothing, you've brought up, brought around more change in the past two months than all of these political parties and companies combined in the past maybe 15 years. And that's great. So it's not only about politics. Politics is very, very important. I just want to say a word about politics. It's such a bad word these days. <laughs> um, look. A bad doctor doesn't mean medicine is something that is bad, okay? Um, maybe we have more than one bad doctor, <laughs> but politics is, is, I think, is the greatest service that you can possibly be involved in because it's the service of mankind, the service of people, uh, the service of the public. And um, of course, it's so easily be easily corruptible, but I think as interactors, you have to absolutely be interested in politics. You absolutely have to understand how profound a science and an art politics is. You have to be reading um, the great um, theories of politics. You have to understand uh, what Plato and Socrates and Hobbes and Immanuel Kant said about politics. You've got to understand even um, our Asian tradition of politics, okay, uh, Arthashastra by Kautilya. Um, there are so there's so much art and science in politics that goes way beyond what we see on news to be politics. That you will, you might realize just how incredible and how important. And you know they say that politi politics is far too important a, a, a subject to be handed over to politicians, <laughs> okay? It's, it's so crucial to our existence because every one of us is different. We have different hopes and dreams and ambitions and characteristics. And it's only politics that can bring us together. It's nothing else. And so if there's one thought I can leave with you is, is be interested in politics. I'm not going to go the other way and say, don't get in, involved in politics because it's a horrible thing. And, you know, it's, it's the pits of the earth right now. But that is not a reflection of what politics should be in Sri Lanka. And unless all of you decide that you, you want to serve this nation in some way, not all of you will be politicians or can be politicians, but to those of you who are interested in it, I would say spend time understanding the philosophy of politics which is very important. The philosophy of anything is important because that gives you the fuel to burn that fire. So understanding the philosophy of politics is important and you can do it as a young person. And then trying to get, trying to, trying to um, inculcate the skills that you need to be somebody who reconciles as opposed to someone who you know, tears apart is very important. So that's my challenge to all of you interactors out there. Beautiful said, sir. I believe that hopefully by the end of this conversation, at least one of these interactors would be motivated to become a good doctor, as you mentioned. The next president of Sri Lanka. The next Another president of Sri Lanka. Maybe, maybe a couple of uh, presidents down the line. <laughs> Definitely, sir. And this, everyone, is what social platform is all about. 
So once again, I would like to thank our esteemed guest, Mr. Shivan Daniel, for being here despite your busy schedule. We know that you are a person who actively tries your level best to do what's best for this country, to create a better climate in this country for the generations of leaders that follow you, that follow your footsteps. So once again, a big thank you for you, for being here with us today, for speaking to this larger audience of interactors, for sharing your stories, for sharing your insight with them and teaching us something and giving us the motivation and the passion and the fire to take things to the next level and become good citizens of Sri Lanka who will defend and protect their motherland. Thank you very, very much, everyone. I thank the audience for staying with us till the very end. We can see there's a lot of viewers joining us on YouTube. Thank you very much for staying in, uh, tuning in with us. We hope to see you all very soon. Until then, stay safe and take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Good night.